Lord us pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving amongst us. Thank you, God. When you just allow us to soak ourselves in a time of praise and worship, and to experience you, to experience your kindness to us, to experience your love for us. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds to listen to your scriptures this morning, we pray that beyond the reading of the scriptures, we will meet you face to face and that you will touch us and that our lives will be changed. And so bless us, we pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. We're going to take our first reading and the last reading in <laughs> the Gospel of Jesus recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 24. We read verse 36 to 48, and Nelly will read that for us. <clears throat> Joining us. Mark Luke, sorry, Mark Luke. <laughs> John, yeah. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they did not, still, still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your challenges. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let us pray again. Thank you for the reading of the word, the reading of your word, God. Now send down your Holy Spirit from heaven to interpret the words for us. And so may the words of my mouth this morning, the meditations of my heart, be accepted into your kingdom, Lord God, my Savior. Amen. I, 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 I said when, when I opened the service that I love this, this weather. I really do. <clears throat> I, I love it. Um, I, no, man, I'm tired of wiping my sweat on my face. <laughs> so... <clears throat> 
Yeah, uh, I can feel that I am in the Buffalo City now. <laughs> So I want to take this moment to welcome those who are joining us for the first time. And so please feel free to raise up your hand if you are amongst us this morning. We really want to welcome you and to make sure that you feel at home. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you there in the back. Um, um, thank you. Please, please, please make time that you... We've got plenty of stewards in the service. Um, um, make sure that you speak to one of them so they can explain to you about the life of our church. Um, and so we, we're looking forward to have you next time visiting us. Next Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, anybody want to share any testimony or anything good before we get onto the last leg of the service? You know, when you start that one, you can't stop me. Anybody who wants to share anything? I'm happy if you don't have. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. <clears throat> He was so happy and excited and with such plans for the future now. So I just want to say thank you, Lord, for saving my brother. And yeah, thank you for all of you that shared prayers as well. Bless you all. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. We give all the honor to God for the work that he's done to your brother and to many people who are continuing to receiving healing from God. Thank you. Hi, John. Hi, John. And uh, I just learned something there too, which was so nice, was that he said, no, don't always pray just for God to protect your children and your grandchildren. Pray for him to save your families, which for me was a great revelation. So, yeah, it, uh, if we have another one of those, I reckon try and make it. It's, it was really good. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Indeed, it was an amazing talk. Thank you. Last one. Okay, cool. My name is Willie Boote, for you that don't know me. Uh, in December, my wife was diagnosed with colon cancer. And uh, the power in prayer is amazing. She had gone for an operation. And she does not need any treatment thereafter. So I just praise the Lord for that. Thank you. God continues to show how great He is in our lives. Blessings upon blessings and grace upon grace. Uh, and we, we, we fall down before His throne of grace for the many things that He does for us. And may His name continue to be praised. And may healing continue to happen. If it doesn't happen to you for now, please be patient of the Lord. Your time has come. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so we continue this morning with the story of resurrection. Um, and post-resurrection or events of Jesus Christ appearing to his disciples and beginning to minister to people. And so the gospel writers are very clear in giving a Jesus who appears in various ways to different people and different disciples at different times and different places. And the story that we just read 
it's, it's an interesting story of the disciples who the Bible tells us that they were locked in a room. Just after Jesus was crucified, and as Jesus began to appear, they were in locked rooms. Now I want to imagine that they were busy trying to process a new life without the one who claimed to be life. They were processing that. That the one who was the Messiah is no more. And, and the Bible is very clear that they were terrified. So there's a sense in which we can all agree that that faith was hugely challenged. That trust was compromised. And all what they had from Jesus was something that they probably began to doubt. And so they closed themselves, themselves in a room. And again, I want to assume and suggest that probably because they were ashamed. They were ashamed of the teachings that they've been supporting and following. But again, because their memory was very, very short, they forgot that there was something that Jesus said and mentioned in his teaching. <clears throat> that should it happen that this temple is destroyed, he will wake up on the third day, rebuild it. And so now they are here in a locked room. And I'm just thinking that they were trying to devise a new strategy. How do you get out of this room and go and continue the work that we were taught? What do we tell people about this Jesus? Who exactly is this man, Jesus? Because for three years, they had the opportunity to have a first-hand information from him. And they trusted that this is the Messiah who will carry them into eternity. And so in their minds, it cannot be correct that the Messiah dies. It cannot be correct. And so I'm just suggesting and thinking that they went into a room and locked themselves to try and work out plan A. Or they try to look at plan A and now they have to find plan B to fall on. And so because, I mean, you, you've got to have a strategy in this life. And so business people know if this fails, you quickly go to this. You don't jump to close the business. You always have an option. Before you come to a conclusion that uh, this thing is not working, you work on a strategy. The same with the church. If, if we are church and we have an intention to build the church and to hold it together, we have to develop a strategy of retention. How do we retain our members? And so the disciples went into a room and began to work on a strategy. And so it's always important to have that plan B. And so my theme this morning is faith as a treasure. You see, in Christianity, faith is often seen as a treasure because it is considered a precious and valuable quality that brings a sense of peace, that brings a sense of purpose, and that brings a sense of hope to individuals and to corporate people. But you see, faith is a very interesting concept. Because faith says to us that you need to trust in something greater than yourself. 
that you've got to trust in something unseen. And so, just like a treasure, faith is something to be cherished, to be protected, to be nurtured, but also to be shared with others. It is something that brings joy. It's something that brings blessings. If you like, you can again say, faith is when you praise God in the storm. It is when you trust God in the valley. And it is when you choose to follow God, even in darkness. But you see, strong faith is based on the facts of God's weight, the truth of our salvation, the historic fact of Christ's resurrection, and the understanding that this Christ will come back again in our lives. That's faith. And so we need to be gentle with this faith. We need, when Paul speaks about treasure in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the supposing power belongs to God and not to us. And so Jesus, when he speaks about the treasure, is there, your heart will also be. And so in the story that we read this morning, that Nelly read, it's in Luke chapter 24, the disciples were locked in a room and still talking about the events of the death of this man. And something happened. You, you know when you are just confused and you're having this conversation about the confusion and then revelation steps into the confusion. And then you open your eyes. And, and so they're busy talking about, almost like, nah, bro, tell me about this, Jesus. Was that a fake? What, what, what was that about? He just came to show us this and then disappeared. And so they were in this conversation. And so let's, let's engage, guys. Let's engage. Uh, we're about to go and face the world. We're about to go and face the realities. And there are so many questions coming out. And, and so let's plan this. And, and so as they were busy planning and drawing up the map, which community are we going to go first and convince? Immediately Jesus stepped into the room. Now you can imagine the silence. Oops. Who is he? Others like, it's a ghost, man. It's a ghost. And so if he's a ghost, we better run, man. Or if you can't run, kneel down and pray. <laughs> um, and, and ask the Lord to remove this spirit of the ghost. And so Jesus saw that they were shaking on their boots. And he says to them, why are you troubled? Why do you doubt? Why? Why are you so confused? Look at the wounds on my hands. Look at the wounds on my feet. Look at the wound on my side. It's me. I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't have flesh, flesh and blood and bones. Let me just check with you. Have you ever seen something in your life that is so unbelievable? Huh? Anybody? Something very scary. I, I, I know I know that many of us experience that. And, and, and maybe it is so scary that you don't even want to visit those memories. And a lot of us can relate to that. There are so many scary, scary and and crazy sins in our lives that we don't want to visit and revisit. Friends, post-resurrection stories reveals the fragility of the disciples. Post-resurrection stories reveals the fragility of our own life stories. 
And so here Jesus is forced to prove himself and to convince the disciples that he's not a ghost. That is the risen Christ. And so to try to dispel that idea of the ghost, he show them his hands, feet, and the side. You see, the purpose of the appearance of Jesus or the purpose of the post-resurrection events are in three folds. The first one is that Jesus wants to prove to his disciples about the truth about resurrection and that he wants to strengthen the disciples' faith. The second is that he wants to give them an instruction and to prepare them for the mission to continue to go and spread the message of the gospel. The third thing is that he wanted to serve, he wanted this message to serve as a comfort to give them. To give them. He also, no, let me let me rephrase this. That he his last the last aspect to the post-resurrection story is to serve as a comfort to them and to give them peace. For them to know that death will never, ever overpower life. But interestingly, the disciples did not immediately believe that. They did not immediately believe the resurrected story. Perhaps it all it started, perhaps it still seemed too good to be true. So, so they battled with that idea. Even when they saw the wounds, even when they saw the side, doubt and doubts arose in their minds. And, and we go through that as human beings when we struggle with the realities of faith, what faith brings in our lives. Because you see, the challenge with faith is we believe in things unseen. But those moments cause us to go into a deep moment of discernment and discern the will of God and to hear exactly what God is trying to communicate to us when we doubt. Because sometimes when you doubt, those become moments of yourself and not moments of God. Friends, can I say that we have to trust God even in uncertain times? And that we can be, become a, a church that looks like God. It is possible to become a church that looks like God. What do I mean when I say that? I mean that we can become a church that is larger than the sum of our parts. According to the New Testament, we are the one body of Christ, an assembly of parts that only function in unison. This is what we call church. Let me go a little bit deeper on this. That you can become a church that is like Jesus. Or you can become a church that looks like God when you give your heart to Jesus. And when you give your hands and feet to be used by God. You see, the complexity of our faith journey is that always like the disciples, we wait to hear God saying to us, here are the wounds. I'm not a ghost. That's the complexity of our faith. You see, but the, the danger again and the exciting thing and the confusing thing is sometimes God takes longer time to reveal himself. Sometimes he takes longer time 
to respond to our prayers. And so when that happens, we wonder if he even cares about us. We wonder if he is concerned about us. And so how many of us have been in that situation where you feel very disappointed? Oh, there's so many pressures outside. And you wait to hear God saying, it is I, be still. But you don't hear him say that. Friends, often we are like the disciples. We fail to meet God in those critical moments of our faith journey. Because our thoughts are only seen in those places of confusion and frustration. And in those places of current circumstances. May I remind us that. God's mission for redemption of humanity is not going to change because Jesus Christ was crucified. May I also again remind us that God's grace reaches out and embraces those who feel weak this morning, who feel lost, whose faith has been shaken, and who feel that, that, like they are locked in a room, hiding somewhere. In fact, the story of Jesus' appearance says to us that our God is a God of our current circumstances. So he knows exactly what you are facing. And he knew it before you faced it. And so for me, the best we can do is to embrace a day like this and trust God in every situation. So I'm coming to the end of this sermon. So, so can I encourage us not to spend a lot of time afraid of the wickedness of the world? In fact, or instead let us focus on the one who is greater than every evil, who is greater than every darkness, who is God. Sometimes we talk too much about the evil one and feels like we're giving the evil some credit. Jesus offered the disciples a new teaching model to help them to begin to see that God can bring a better life after death. And so the reason why we Christians the reason why we spend time coming to church and, 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 and try and deal with this meaning of the scriptures is because we yearn for that life after death. And so we spend hours and years following this Jesus and it's not a waste of time. It is because we're planning for something bigger than the challenges of today. And so in this reading that we read, there's a sense in which Luke calls us to another aspect of life that says to us that Jesus came to heal our physical, our mental, our spiritual, and emotional needs. And that he continues to do that in this world, especially as we gather around in a world that sometimes find it difficult to gather. And so in verse 44, Luke reminds us that Jesus came to satisfy the prophecies made about Jesus in the Old Testament. And so Jesus is the revelation of God's story of redemption. Theologians will argue that Jesus was concealed in the Old Testament and it became revealed in the New Testament. And so everything that was said in the prophecies in the Old Testament was fulfilled in the New Testament. No wonder Jesus taught his disciples in the scriptures while he was here, even post-resurrection, he referred people to the scriptures. Because I think he wanted them to understand the significance 
of the past. But as again, you see, depending on how you articulate your past, there is richness in the old story. We were blessed yesterday as John was sharing to have Dr. Eugene speaking to us at our fellowship breakfast. And so he emphasized the importance of sharing stories, sharing your past. And so in the whole of his talk, you could see that the man was speaking from the heart. And for me, it is because our stories and the story of God lies in our hearts. And so it's a challenge to all of us, like the disciples this morning, go now and share the story of Christ. Friends, like the disciples, sometimes we wrestle with the idea of life after death. But we also know that his, his resurrection has made it possible for our own resurrections. And that resurrection is a plan of God. And because it's a plan of God, we will also one day resurrect. Like the disciples, our task is to share the story of this new life. Friends, the disciples were physical witnesses to the resurrection. And we are the witnesses to the risen Christ through the authority of the scriptures. That's where our faith is. We rely on the scriptures. We become witnesses of the mystery of resurrection when we gather in God's space. And when we come together and share in the table of Holy Communion, we become the witnesses of Christ. We become the witnesses of Christ when we do kind act for someone else. When we invite a friend or a neighbor to come and worship with us. We become witnesses of Christ when we get, wake, get up in the morning and decide to let God to guide our steps. And so I pray that we, the people called Christians, will become the witnesses of the resurrected Christ. That we will share that story. There's a story told about, about Martin Luther. That one day he was in his room and a visitor came knocking. And so the visitor says, um, I'm looking for Martin. Does Martin live here? And a voice from inside said, no. And it was Martin answering. He said, no. <laughs> uh, Martin died long time ago. It is Christ who now lives here. And so the appearances of the resurrected Christ calls for the old to die and for the new to come into a new life and to live victoriously in Christ for the simple reason that 1 John chapter 4 says that greater is the one who lives in you than the one who lives in the world. May the Lord bless us. May the Lord continue to reveal himself to us. We take a moment just to reflect in the word of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming to our space. Thank you, Jesus, for, for dying for us. Thank you, God, for choosing us to become a generation of witnesses of your goodness. So touch our lives and transform them. Touch our lips as we speak about your name. Heal us through your scriptures. Restore us through the proclamation of your word. We pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.
and so friends, we will use this time to continue to worship the lord.